Give us a sense of the importance then, the significance of this upgrade that you're seeing in terms of the software for your vehicles. What does it mean in terms of functionality? Yes, thanks, Tom. Um, pleasure to be on. Well, this is actually, uh, we are set to launch our uh, next OTA, which is what we call the uh, XSmart 2.5 uh, OTA system. This is actually going to be the most powerful and most comprehensive OTA upgrade of our software in our six year history. Uh, it will have over 40 new functions launched upon this OTA and another 200 plus optimizations of existing functions that will be incorporated. And the most exciting part of this uh, OTA will be the launch of our NGP, which is the Navigation Guided Pilot, which is a, a you know autonomous driving feature that allows driver to uh, you know use the vehicle itself to you know navigate on highway to the destination uh, by you know changing lane, overtaking, exiting, and merging, etc. So that's going to change uh, the people driving China, and we think this is going to you know revolutionize the way that you know, autonomous driving is going to be handled in volume vehicles in China. How close then, Brian, does that take us to, to fully autonomous for Xpeng? What is the timeline looking like now? Well, I think this is uh, the very, you know, it's one of the first steps. Uh, obviously, this is what we call, you know, close to level three functions, but that will still require a driver behind the wheels. And also, this is only launched on highways today. Uh, and I think uh, and over time, we'll have this similar features launched on urban roads, normal streets, and gradually, and I think it was more data and more powerful algorithm and computing uh, uh, chips, you will be able to actually remove the driver ultimately in a few years' time. So this is actually the, one of the first steps in a volume-produced vehicle to launch autonomous driving. Okay, Brian, and you, you talked about chips there, and, and all of these systems, the software, the hardware as well, all involves chips, hundreds of chips. We know there's been supply constraints. We know that other automakers have been impacted. We know that there have been calls for the makers, TSMC, the, the officials in, in Taiwan as well, to step up production. Have you been impacted by this? And what does it tell you? How does it inform how you try to position to avoid being caught up in some of these vulnerabilities around supply chains? Yeah, I think we're aware of some of the shortage uh, situations. So luckily, we haven't been impacted by uh, these shortages. Uh, first of all, I think we are uh, focusing on high-end smart vehicles. We use high-end chips, uh, which are not mass-produced like the other chips in the uh, more mass production vehicles. Secondly, is our volume uh, for this year and next year uh, still are relatively manageable compared to some larger OEMs that requires hundreds of thousands, if not millions of vehicles with chipsets. I think that's where I think the shortage will, will be focused on. Uh, Brian, just to continue that, 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 that trail of thought here, in terms of parts, you know, investors have been essentially betting on the sector for years, and obviously it's paid, pay, you know, paid, uh, you know, paid well, quite, quite nicely these last 12 months. They've also been betting on, on the sort of more indirect paths to the market. You know, your parts makers, a good example would be chip makers. Uh, my, my question to you is to, to obviously help investors try and navigate you know, how they can invest around the future of the sector. You probably know a lot more about what goes into these cars. Tell us, in about, say, three years' time, what, what parts do you think uh, are going to go into these EVs at that point in time that perhaps aren't as much in demand right now? Well, I think, uh, you know, EV and normal automobiles share a lot of parts in common. So a lot of the suppliers will be the same suppliers um, for small EVs. But the, the, the suppliers that's, you know, going to pro provide different uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, components will be, you know, related to powertrain, battery, uh, computing chipsets, as well as uh, um, architecture and sensors, etc. Those, I think, will be uh, uh, more used in our smart vehicles, and those, I think, will see more, you know, significant growth. Okay, um, wh what's your sense then of of of, of pricing in the sector uh, in terms of trends, especially? Uh, what, what many would consider, say, the mass market price points uh, uh, of this market? Well, historically, I think the EV market has been focused on the two polarized markets. One is the high end, uh, obviously, with Tesla entering market, 
uh, at a higher point, you know, a few years back, as well as Neo and others uh, targeting in China, 350,000 above market. Uh, that's where a lot of the startups have been focusing on. And also the low end market, the, the market that below 150,000 has been quite popular with domestic EV makers. But to, today, I think uh, you start to see uh, the, the, the what we call the mid to high end market that where exponents focus on is actually getting a lot of attention. This is where the most sizable market segment for auto sales today. And also this is less penetrated by the EV makers. So we think this is actually going to represent the the best growth potential, which we call the mid to high end, um, 150,000 to 300,000 RMB price points. Okay, and just I guess to educate us on where you guys think the industry actually is in terms of its development phase, uh, would, who would you consider your, your main competitors still? I mean, do you still look at specific EV makers as your main competition or do you also look at traditional already look at traditional automakers as also part of that mix? Well, I think, uh, you know, for us, uh, you know, our competitors evolve over time. Uh, obviously, when we start our business, we compete with a number of other startups and some domestic domestic OEM makers. But now I think with the entrance of more, you know, sort of a multinationals uh, products coming to China, more technology companies and try to, you know, partner with uh, OEMs to launch automobiles, we start to see the competitor dynamic change uh, quite a bit. But I think, I think, you know, in the future, though, you know, we we view the competition mostly in the technology side. The, the, the players who can actually really develop a uh, full stack uh, technology really can uh, provide a smart uh, driving experience for um, consumers. Those will be the main competitors for us. I think the traditional OEMs will be less likely to be our competitors. Brian, you have all these upgrades. I know you've got a new model as well being lined up for this year. Can you give us a forecast for sales for 2021? Well, Tom, as you know, you've been asking this every time, but uh, it's hard for us to provide yeah. forecasts. You know, we're a public company, and this is very early in the year. Mm. Uh, we won't be giving forecasts as we obviously develop uh, more uh, uh, understanding of the, uh, the market trends. But we see very significant demand uh, momentum still in the China market. Our volume uh, more than doubled last year, and we see that trend uh, not letting down. So we see this uh, at least doubling uh, more uh, for this year as well. Okay, and, and I touched on this new model, the P the P five, uh, which is expected to launch, as I said, twenty twenty one later this year. Do, do we have an update on on the timing for that launch, Brian? Well, uh, first of all, we haven't uh, finalized the name of this model yet. So P five is what actually the market has been, you know. Uh, speculating. Uh, we, we will be announcing the specific model number. But this third model will be launched this year. And uh, we think uh, we will be uh, launching the vehicle with its full specification and pricing probably in a few months. Uh, and then starting the delivery to mass market uh, by the beginning of fourth quarter. Uh, Brian, very, very quickly. I'm not sure if you're going to answer this question, but I'll ask it anyway. Would you consider listing here in Hong Kong? I know you guys raised just, uh, just raised money a few weeks ago. Yeah, so from a fun, uh, fundraising perspective, we have been quite successful last year. Uh, we raised over $5 billion U.S. dollars through the IPO and follow-on and pre-IPO. Um, so we are well-funded for our business plan. Um, but I think, uh, you know, obviously we are monitoring the market uh, very closely, uh, the geo geopolitical dynamics uh, between the U.S. and China. Uh, all these factors will go into our you know, thinking around whether we enlist ourselves in Hong Kong. But, you know, all we can say now is we are closely monitoring the situation.